In this talk, I want to talk about some of the interesting features about rotifers. And one is that many species can exhibit this phenomenon known as cyclomorphosis. And as the name implies, uh, morphosis, there's a change in form, and that that can occur in a, it can occur in a cyclical way. And, and what that change is, is the fact that some rotifers will develop these kinds of spines, these lateral spines in some cases. And so uh, sometimes you'll see the same... Uh, species that have individuals with and without spines. And this difference does not represent uh, genotypic differences within the population, but are in fact uh, induced phenotypic differences that are induced by uh, environmental circumstances. Okay, so when you have something in the environment that can induce this change. It's more of a polyphenism as opposed to a polymorphism, which implies a genetic basis. So there's, there's no genetic, genetic basis to this. And often what is in the environment that triggers the production of, of spines like this is the fact that, they, that there are predators nearby. Okay, So there's probably some sort of chemical cues in the water. And so when rotifers are cultured with water that contains chemical cues from predators, it's the next generation of individuals that will produce these spines. So you can't like throw a predator at a rotifer that's already there and it will grow spines. It can't do that. But it will produce offspring that will have the spines. Here are some photographs of a species of rotifer called Caratella. And uh, you can see the enlarged spines on this individual and a single enlarged spine over here on this individual, again induced by environmental cues. Here are the results of some quick experiments where if you culture uh, this certain species of Caratella in a control medium, you may see the complete absence of spines or you may have some short spines. So there is a, a range, there is phenotypic variation in the degree to which you see spine formation. But if you culture those um, the same species, individuals of the same species in a medium that contains this predator called Asplantia, and Asplantia is a predator that is also a species of rotifer, but it's a much larger predatory rotifer. Um, so if you take um, some water that had Asplantia growing in it, right, and then take that water to culture the Caratella slack eye, um, you'll see that the range of spines that are produced by the offspring of the next successive generations will have much larger lateral spines. And of course, as you might uh, guess that this represents um, a form of protection against predation. If you have these big spines, it's much harder for a rotifer or another predator to be able to um, consume that prey. Here we have, instead of just pictures, we have a little bit more data where you can see that if you culture Caratella with just paramecium as a control, right, that, that most of the individuals have shorter spines in this uh, range about here. Um, and, it, and then another um, control is to culture them with uh, tropocyclops, uh, which is another type of crustacean that is not a predator for rotifers. And you see the same uh, distribution of individuals with relatively uh, medium to short size spines. And then if you culture them with Asplantia, the predatory species that I talked about, uh, the distribution or the range of individuals in, is broader, but definitely includes those individuals which with that have um, much larger spines and, the, and definitely a greater uh, median uh, spine length in those individuals. So this data answers the question, if the development of the spines are for the protection against predators, how effective are they against being eaten by predators? And so we see a couple of experiments here 
where they looked at the equal number of individuals of each type, so different starting sample sizes in, in these different cases here. Um, and so you look at the percentage that they ate of short spine versus long spine. In, in every case, they ate more short spine individuals than they did long spined individuals. And um, these differences were significant in all three cases except the very first one, probably due to just a small sample size here. Another really fascinating aspect of rotifer biology is that they, they go through these different kinds of cycles. So there is a um, asexual cycle, also referred to as the amictic cycle, okay? And then there is a mictic phase, all right, which involves sexual reproduction. Okay, let's look first just at the a mictic cycle, which is over here. And if we start out with sort of a typical a diploid female, that females will actually produce eggs through mitosis instead of meiosis, right? So if you have a diploid individual and it produces eggs mitotically, those eggs are going to still be diploid, right? <clears throat> and then uh, when those eggs develop into females, they're still going to be diploid females, all right, so what happens is these eggs can develop into adults without being fertilized, okay? And, th and this is an important concept here that you may have learned in other classes, but the, the word parthenogenesis refers to the development of an unfertilized egg into the adult organism. And so we see parthenogenetically produced females through the development of these unfertilized diploid amictic eggs, okay? And so what is this going to do? Well, if you have unfertilized eggs that just grow up into adults, this is asexual reproduction here, okay? And these females, of course, are going to produce more diploid eggs and then diploid females, and around and around we go, right? And we tend to see that there are uh, environmental stimulants associated with uh, this cycle compared to when they may enter the mictic phase, all right? So often it's in the summertime or the spring when everything's really nice and good and conditions are great and there isn't really a lot of stuff that's going on in their environment that's too harsh, um, that they'll just happily reproduce asexually. And I want you to think about the fact that um, if there are environmental uh conditions that don't provide any challenges to these individuals, then having genetically similar clones of individuals should be okay because that environment's not changing, right? So if you think about the fact that the stability in the environment may be uh, responsible for the fact that you might have a stability in genotypes within the population, okay? That that may make some sense. Now, what happens when the environment changes? So especially when you see towards the end of this season, um, when it starts to get colder, when fall may start to come in and turn to winter, uh, things get a little bit less predictable. You might start to see cold, right, in the winter time here. Um, and then what happens is that those kinds of environmental stimuli can stimulate these females over here, Okay, so I'm going back over here. To, to produce eggs via meiosis instead of mitosis, right? So if we have meiotically produced eggs, those eggs now are going to be haploid, right? Or 1N eggs. So now we have diploid females producing eggs through meiosis, and the eggs are now haploid. Now those haploid eggs can um, develop through parthenogenesis again, Okay, the development of an unfertilized egg into an adult is parthenogenesis. So if those haploid eggs develop parthenogenetically, they become males. All right, so parthenogenetically developed diploid eggs become females. Parthenogenetically developed haploid eggs become males. And of course, because the eggs were haploid, the adults are also haploid. So we have these haploid males who can produce sperm. And if you think about it, and let me ask the question, is, are this, are, is the sperm being produced by meiosis the way we normally think of it, or is the sperm being produced by mitosis? So let me just let you think about that for one second. 
Okay, so I hope you said mitosis and not meiosis, which is typical, because these guys are um, already haploid. There's no chromosomes to reduce, right? So they're producing haploid sperm, all right? And when you've got males around producing sperm, they can fertilize the eggs of the females, all right? So you've got haploid eggs over here, haploid sperm over here, right? Sperm and eggs. Fertilization can result in a diploid zygote, okay? Eventually, um, now you've got the, uh, the, the eggs that are formed as a result of that fertilization process. And these eggs are referred to as resting eggs. And that's because they um, are kind of in a dormant state. You can recognize a resting egg because it has a thicker shell around it. Sometimes they look very black in some species. And so these resting eggs are also sometimes um, called winter eggs uh, for the purposes that I mentioned before because those kinds of winter conditions can um, stimulate the onset of the production of these kinds of eggs. So the winter eggs or resting eggs are the result of fertilization. Of course, we have sexual reproduction going on over here. This is the mictic phase of the life cycle. When those eggs hatch out, usually from positive environmental stimulus, so these guys can hang out all winter, right? When it's cold, when it's dry, all right? And then when the environment gets nice again and the sun starts to shine and things warm up and the rains come, the environment will stimulate the hatching of the resting eggs, which will develop into the diploid females. And again, those females may just go through this amictic cycle for a while until the next season where environmental stimulus causes them to produce haploid eggs through meiosis. I just wanted to give you another uh, picture. This is a diagram of the same exact thing that I was talking about before. Sometimes it helps to have more than one picture of this. So we see that we have summer eggs that are produced via mitosis from amictic females, right? Those develop parthenogenetically into amictic diploid females that uh, again produce eggs via mitosis. So the eggs are still diploid, parthenogenesis, uh, production of eggs into adult females, around and around we go. That's the summer cycle or the amictic cycle. Okay, summer amictic. <clears throat> Mixus stimulus occurs again by those kinds of conditions like winter type conditions that will cause the um, females to start producing eggs via meiosis. All right, this meiosis here is really important. So we have these diploid females that, when stimulated, will produce haploid ova via meiosis. Those develop parthenogenetic genetically into males. So if a haploid egg develops into an adult, it's going to be a male. All right, and now we have the haploid male that can produce sperm via mitosis. Okay, and now that sperm is available. Okay, because we're talking about several individuals here. If a haploid male produces sperm that can now fertilize the eggs of the female, they'll produce a zygote that becomes dormant. So this is where we see the winter or the resting eggs. All right, and these winter or resting eggs, again, in the spring, when conditions become nice again, will hatch into the amictic females. These different cycles have some fascinating consequences. Um, for some species, there's only amixis, and so you have, never see the production of any kind of males because there's never any meiosis. So there's certain rotifer species that consist exclusively of females, and they're, um, all, uh, the, all of their reproduction is asexual. Um, and the other consequence is that the resting eggs, sometimes they can stay dormant for more than just a season. There have been instances where people have collect, collected resting eggs of rotifers that are in the sediments of lakes or ponds. And if you go down deep enough, some of those eggs have been there for years and years and years. And so you can collect a sample that may have some rotifer eggs that date back 50 or even 100 years. And that can be really fascinating because if you can uh, collect some of those eggs and bring them into a lab and get them to hatch out, you can take a look at what the rotifer population looked at uh, looked like maybe a hundred years ago and compare that to today.